You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Moritz Siebert and I, Niels Kastel-Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. If you're new to the show, let me start by saying welcome with the hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity and hunger for learning enough to check out the back catalog and listen to some of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Robert Carver, which was a really fun conversation and where we also shared how we got into trend following in the first place. Moritz, it's great to see you this week. Great to be back with you. How are things where you are? Great to see you. Good to be back. Doing really great. We've had fantastic weather here in the mountains, sunshine. I actually managed to get a little bit sunburned, believe it or not, in early February or mid-February. Two hours of cross-country skiing over lunch today. So doing really fine. Life's good. Yeah, sounds like it. Now... This week's market wrap will be a little bit longer, and I want to address just some of the things that's happening in the commodity markets. And this week, we saw that the rise of the commodity prices that started last summer continued, and it is attracting a lot of attention by now, not just because commodity recently as an asset class has been attracting a lot of money over the last uh, year or so, but also because of the intra-market implications. Stronger commodity prices are usually dependent on a stronger global economy. That's especially true of economically sensitive commodities that are dependent on global demand. Rising commodity prices also imply rising inflation, which puts pressure upwards towards the bond yields, which may be the reason to the recent kind of stealth uh, rise in yields. Stronger commodities are also usually associated with a weaker dollar, which also carries inflationary potential. Now, the bigger question is, of course, how strong are the commodity prices really and how high may they be heading? Now, the Fed appears at least to be rooting for the commodity rally to continue. Weak commodity prices over the last decades were reflected in the deflationary tendencies that existed during that period. This year's higher commodity move signals a shift from a more or to a more inflationary environment, which the Fed is trying to achieve with its easy money policies. From a monetary standpoint, it used to be easier for the Fed to deal with inflation by raising interest rates, but with all the debt that it's amounted now, it may not be in a hurry to do so. Fighting deflation has turned out to be much harder to do, which is why the Fed now probably welcomes rising commodity prices, which will in time lead to higher consumer prices. The most direct result of rising commodity prices is falling bond prices. And that in turn contributes to an initial rotation out of bonds into stocks or commodities, which rise together in that more inflationary environment, at least initially. To me, rising interest rates are often viewed as a sign of confidence in the economy. But back when I was a kid in the 1970s, we did had, or we did have rising interest rates, but we didn't really have such a great economy and no growth at that time. And yet people tend to talk about inflation or deflation, but they never talk about the stack in the middle. To go full circle with all of this, the inconvenient truth is that stocks and bonds are positively correlated over the long run. And the scenario that is described in what I just said, is one that could lead to a coordinated sell-off in both of these assets, which would, of course, be devastating for many traditional portfolios, including pension funds. And this is why I, and I'm sure Moritz feels the same, we believe so strongly that all portfolios need trend following, given its non-correlated attributes. And it's important to note that I base my belief on all the evidence and research available and I'm often reminded of a study done a few years ago by one of our previous guests on the podcast, Alex Grazerman, where he did 1 million different portfolio allocations across traditional and alternative assets and where the results showed that a 30% allocation, I'll repeat that, a 30% allocation to trend following increased the risk-adjusted returns every single time. So with that, Moritz... 
we're going to set the stage for uh, hearing about how your rocket ship is going mm. this year so far. Yeah, uh, I actually uh, have a lot of thoughts about what you just said. So I think it's going to be a long podcast, but um, before we before we go down that rabbit hole, um, let's review performance. Um, I think when we last spoke, I informed you about my best, I think, return star to a year on the trend following trading system. Yep. And I think it was I was up something like 10% in the, in the first 10 days or the first uh, 14 days or something like that. And uh, I then had a little bit of a give back toward the later part of January, and I ended January up uh, 4.72%. And in February, I'm up 9.46%. So for a total of 14.62% up year to date. So pretty strong numbers for that trend following trading system. And nothing has changed since we last spoke. Not a single new entry, no exit, just complete frozen portfolio, long only, only long positions. Frightening, I know, but you know, it is what it is. And it's up 14.62% this year. So, um, you know, there's it's just, you know, these markets are moving higher. You've mentioned the commodities, energy is higher. Um, natural gas has woken up a bit as well. The grains continue to move higher. Corn strong, wheat strong, soybeans strong. Amazing. I'm not sure how long it's last. How long it'll last? Nobody knows that. Uh, people talk about a uh, emerging commodity supercycle. I don't know what a commodity supercycle is. I know people speak about that and they, they find a definition for what a supercycle is. I, I honestly don't get that. I don't know. China has been buying a lot of corn to feed their hogs. Oftentimes, as you also know, it's kind of like you have these big purchases in commodities and and the eggs. They move up and then. The cure for high prices is high prices, and the underinvestment that occurred in the past is is, is rectified, and um, the market finds a new balance. And you know those markets could be heading down sooner you, before you know it. So um, let's see. In general, with all of the stuff that's going on there, I want to be very careful. Obviously, I cannot prove it in in any shape or form, but I have this kind of like Soros type of backache or just a bad feeling about these markets. Sometimes I have a feeling that the, the wheels are going to pop off at some point and um, it's wild. So uh, it's, yeah, be be careful. So let me, if I, if you don't mind, let me ask you just a couple of questions because that is a phenomenal start to the year and congratulations on that. So two things springs to mind, maybe just to help people better understand how and why you're doing so well. Does this mean, I imagine that your, for example, your grain positions have been on for some time. So does, does that mean that you got in at a relatively low ATR, meaning low volatility period, which allowed you to take, quote unquote, larger position size in terms of contracts, not in terms of risk, of course? I have it printed out here. I, I don't have a history of the ATR, so I cannot answer that question in, in a technically precise way. But I can tell you that I entered corn on the 28th of October. So this is uh, 73 trading days since I entered that that market. I think I've been relatively late to the long position in crude oil, but I think this is also a lot to do with the fact or with the way that I roll crude oil contracts. I'm not front month to front month. If I were doing that, I would have picked it up much sooner and I would have been long much sooner, but I only got long on the 7th of December. And that is because I roll relatively far out in crude. Yeah. Well, what are the markets that are producing kind of most of that oomph in your performance, so to speak? It's a lot of stuff. Well, the equity is up. I have a very large open profit on um, the AEX, on the Aussie dollar, a large open profit in, in copper. I have a large open profit in soybeans. That's actually the largest. Okay. And soybean mean as well. And Nikkei. Nikkei is a position that I have on <laughs> since June. The longest holded yeah. uh, position, right? We agreed on that uh, last month. We talked about it. We both in our portfolios have Nikkei as the longest position held. Exactly. Yeah. So this is all very good for the trend following trading system. Now, what, what probably you don't know, and I haven't mentioned it to a lot of people, is that I have substantially, very, very substantially reduced my exposure to trend following in recent months. And I've never traded probably a small allocation as part of my portfolio. So the the fourteen point six two percent that I've mentioned is uh, you know a now smaller part of my portfolio. 
and you know my my overall portfolio is f fortunately up even even more than that you can guess as to why that is right it has to do with digital assets and all these nice things but it's just you know when you look out there i mean there are now so many alternatives that i've spoken about and which which are not unique to me many people have discovered that but i've taken the decision well you know there's um something like a bitcoin cash and carry trade that makes you between 30 and 40 percent a year on a hedge position as a trader i kind of feel that i have to do these trades and give those trades room vis-a-vis -vis my trend following portfolio because they have a substantially higher sharp ratio right it's kind of like every month is positive every month is up i know that my trend following trading system isn't up every month it has a good start into the year but um you know just from a i'm in that business to make money and right now the alternatives that are offered to me to us by the market are such that i have to adjust and so if i heard you did i did i hear you right saying that you're down to 14 percent of your overall portfolio is now no, no. trend following no 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 my, my trend following system just the pure trend following component if i split yep. this out right out of the out of the n number of things that i trade in my portfolio the trend following uh, component is up 14.62 percent but yes that doesn't mean that my Moritz portfolio is up 14.62% right, because, because it's I do only not a have part of it. It's only yeah. part of it. And trend following used to be a substantially larger part. Right. In, you know, 18, 19, 20, all of the time. Sure. But it stopped being that way this year. So you're doing what David Harding did. You're reducing trend. I am reducing trend, but I am not filling up the free space with the stuff that David is probably filling it up with without knowing the details. Sure. But I'm, I'm not, you know, analyzing fundamental balance sheets or, or doing um, long short equity positions or any of these risk premium factor trades far from it. I'm, I'm actually sure. staying away from that stuff. So no, it's, it's just very specifically for this. And it's, it, it may be a, a period that will soon be over when these um, basis trades and arbitrages are no longer available. And, you know, Rest assured, Niels, if and when that is the case, uh, I'm back on trend following because <laughs> it is the best, most resilient, most robust, most reliable strategy for the long run. Not necessarily for the short run, right? But for the long sure. run, it is. So um, it's probably a temporary phenomenon. It'll be interesting to follow for sure. Now, on our side, the done side, uh, we can't quite keep up with uh, Moritz's start to the year, but uh, it was a positive week as well. Most sectors made money this week except for grains and fixed income, which were flat. Equities, currencies, volatility, and energies had the strongest performance, and metals uh, were okay, but it was really just led by copper. And the strong performance in general is also confirmed by uh, my own trend barometer that's published on the website each day. It finished the week at 61, which is certainly a strong reading, and it should indicate a good environment for trend followers, which is what... Con is confirmed by Moritz and what we're doing at Don and also my own model portfolio. On the volatility side, the VIX index term structure for once in a, in a long time actually showed kind of a textbook reaction as it steepened dram uh, drastically alongside the diminishing realized volatility in the S&P and the VIX index. And while the week did stay around 2022 for most of the week, it actually did close the week below 20 for the first time since COVID-19 broke out last year. So our own volatility program also put in a really good show for this week, for this month, as we benefited from this steepening term structure. For my own trend following model portfolio, it was also up this week. It's up about 5.15% for the month and about 3.5% year to date. Performance so far broken down in terms of the groups of models. It's really the group two, so the, the quote unquote discretionary type models that are doing the best, up 4%. Classical trend also doing well, up 1.7% so far this month, while the faster reacting models are down a couple of percent in terms of sector attributions energy is doing best followed by base metals and energy and the worst sectors really is the bonds and it's the only losing sector so far this month and if we drill down on our market by market basis uh, nikkei doing really well copper platinum the top three and the bottom three is really the bund and the 10-year notes and the dax and all of those markets are 
traded within the fast reacting model and that's probably why those stand out this week uh, so far and in terms of trading activity unlike Moritz where there has been very little activity I had a little bit this week there was some uh, long exposure added in corn in Nikkei in copper in live cattle and also an attempt to go short the US 10 year was done on Thursday and then we exited some long positions in corn on Thursday and Friday. To give everyone kind of an idea of the risk in the portfolio, which um, I define as the risk to stop, meaning if all positions got stopped out tomorrow, how much would I lose? It is down to 12.47%. And last week it was 13.94%. So just being reduced a little bit. All in all, eight trades for the whole week. Now, Moritz, before we move on to some questions that came in from Kevin, Simon, Peter, and and Stasius, I wanted to discuss some of the topics that you had mentioned, and also, in a sense, you've already mentioned it a little bit or alluded to it, and that is, of course, a Bitcoin, which is now approaching 50,000. Talk to me a little bit about Bitcoin, Moritz. <laughs> yes, uh, happy to do so to the extent I can. Before we go into Bitcoin, one thing that we should mention and which I thought is important, it was important last week, last week, Sunday, so exactly one week ago, the CME launched futures contracts on Ethereum. So they're now trading. They kind of like work in the same way as the um, the Bitcoin futures contracts. The multiplier is 50 instead of five. That's because, you know, Ether is trading much lower, about 18, 1900 uh, versus the 50,000 in Bitcoin. It immediately attracted some liquidity. Liquidity and volume is not super, super high right now. It probably needs some time to develop, but uh, it's tradable. And, you know, just as an FYI, the funding basis that's implied in Ethereum is about the same as it is for uh, Bitcoin. So here's another market that can be ARPed with these uh, long short trades. Bitcoin to me is has absolutely no reason not to be long right now, as difficult as that is, right? I know if you're in a position where you do not have Bitcoin now, it feels incredibly difficult to come around and say, you know what, I'm going to buy it at 50K or 49K. By the way, it made a new all-time high today. Today is Sunday. It traded at 49,800 or something like that. I understand that. It's, it's incredibly difficult to go along here. But at the same time, if you step away from that thinking and from your emotions and and you know your your biases with respect to that trade there's no reason not to be long because the trend is the trend is so strong and so massive to the top side and you kind of like i think have to get around to the fact that you need to be long until you're wrong and you're wrong when your stop is hit or your exit is selected so therefore only because bitcoin is approaching 50,000 that does not mean that is now going to half or go back to 10,000 or back to 5,000 or back to 30,000 or is going to have whatever, a 20% correction. Yes, that may happen at any point in time, right? We know that. It may just as well go to 100,000 before the end of April. And, you know, it becomes harder and harder with every day that you're not sitting on that trade. And, you know, people such as Elon Musk coming out and saying that now have they now have 1.5 billion of their reserve assets in Bitcoin obviously makes it even harder. So it's, um, to me, it's, it's, it's a very interesting, a very interesting asset, Bitcoin in particular. I mean, they're all different. All of these coins are different, right? I mean, they overlap in many ways, but Bitcoin kind of like to me is that storehold of wealth. It's the digital goals. And one thing that I believe could trigger something that may be a little bit of an inconvenience to say that way is the fact that you know all the firms that have gone out and purchased bitcoins such as microstrategy for instance right they've just said okay we're going to use it as a storehold of wealth it's now sitting on our balance sheet and elon musk has said the same thing but an additional one also and this is he's willing and going to accept payment in Bitcoin for Tesla automobiles. And that is a different thing because now you're again talking about Bitcoin being money and Bitcoin being a means of payment. And I think this is exactly what Congress, central bankers, et cetera, et cetera, are not keen on hearing. I think, you know, the genies out of the bottle, they, the boat has sailed. 
I don't think that they can and will ban Bitcoin. They will destroy industries. They will, you know, everybody's proud of the US being a technological leader. It's kind of like you, you're stifling that thing. You now have companies such as Tesla, which is kind of like, you know, the Cinderella stock of the US. It's in the S&P 500. Every stock that gets into the S&P 500 enters in, you know, between 470 and 500 in terms of rank. That thing enters at place eight. So it's, it's a rocket ship in many ways. And it's Elon, right? But I don't think that they're ever... They, they do not want you and I or anyone else to pay for goods and services in Bitcoin. They want that to be under their control. And I can absolutely understand why that is. And I actually think it makes sense, right? And maybe Elon is kind of like forcing their hand there a little bit, saying, hey, you know what, guys, I'm going to be accepting Bitcoin for Teslas. Hmm. Right now you have a couple of you know, websites that accept Bitcoin for whatever it is that they're selling, not all of which, by the way, is illegal stuff, right? I mean, there's in, in Switzerland, where you live, by the way, you have Bitcoin ATMs. But all of the stuff that's happening there is minuscule. You buy a pizza with Bitcoin, okay, come on, right? No central banker is going to care about that. But when you have a S&P 500 company that is going out there and saying, I'm going to be accepting Bitcoin for Teslas, might be a game changer. And maybe they're coming in and saying, you know what? We'll accept it in the same way that we're accepting gold. Fine. You need to declare it. We want to tax you on it. Okay. But you're not going to be stepping on our US dollar feet. And you're not going to be using that for payments. That is not allowed. And then we'll see what happens. Maybe Bitcoin doesn't even care. Actually, very high likelihood, I think that that might, might be the case. Assuming that people, you know, consider it such as Michael Saylor as a storeholder of wealth, they, they they couldn't care less if it's used for payments or not, right? So I, I don't want it to be used for payments. I own Bitcoin and I don't want to pay anything with Bitcoin. I want to hold on to my Bitcoin. So I'm not thinking, not, not even closely thinking about using it for purchases. But this, this I think was interesting. Yeah, no, so a couple of thoughts. And I don't really have a, a, a bias one way or the other. As such, I think it's a great, so I want to put that out first. I think it's it's a great trading instrument, especially for trend followers where you uh, where you don't have an opinion about it because I do think it's one of those assets that really divide people in terms of opinion. Um, I want to add a few things that I noticed myself in the last few days. One is that I saw an article out today that, as far as I'm aware, India is going to introduce legislation to ban Bitcoin. So it's not a small country. I'm not saying it's a big country in terms of Bitcoin holders, but that was something I noticed. The other thing is, of course, now with, as you mentioned, Elon Musk's decision that uh, Tesla should buy or have a, a large holding of Bitcoin. And of course, I can't help noticing some of the tongue-in-cheek comments that have gone out uh, because people are now saying of course well that's obviously one way for him to make tesla profitable because he hasn't really succeeded doing it the traditional way and then of course um i was here listening to eric townsend on macro voices this week and he was calling elon musk the biggest con artist of all times because he has become the richest man on the planet in really no time but in fact he's never managed a profitable company so um, so those were some of the comments that I picked up. And maybe and, and, and to some extent, I mean, obviously Eric has a point, I think, but I also think it 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 says something about the world we live in right now. It feels kind of bubbly, not just because of Bitcoin, in my opinion, but also when you look at some of the credit markets, I think junk bonds are trading at, you know, record low yields. And of course, we have to remember that a bubble is always invisible to those who are inside it. I also noticed that, but this guy has a bias because he's got a short position as far as I can tell. But nevertheless, he has proven to make some big calls, and that's Michael Borry from The Big Short. And he came out just saying that the correlation between Bitcoin and Tesla in the last six months has been something like 0.95, which is in incredibly high but he came out saying that okay but maybe musk this this is to uh, to distract people away from the fact that they're facing now some real serious regulatory issues with tesla in china 
who knows? I mean, he, as I said, he's short Tesla, or at some point I read a, a, a headline saying he was short. So that may influence his view, of course. But as I said in the beginning, his track record for making these big calls is there. So again, maybe we shouldn't ignore him. And again, to your point, Moritz, that if Tesla, by the way, now I guess you can buy one Tesla for one Bitcoin. I mean, that's incredible, right? If you go down and you have to pay for a, a whole car like that. But maybe by him accepting pay payments now in Bitcoin, maybe that is the drop that just makes the the water flow out of the uh, out of the cup, so to speak. Um, we, we'll see. The po- the funny thing is, in my view, is that Bitcoin will continue to do what it's doing as long as central banks have this policy of negative interest rates, right? Because it forces investors to take on more risk and embrace new types of investments. So if they were really trying to put an end to this, they should really start by maybe thinking about their own policies um, because I think a lot of the problem lies in, in, in that area. I agree with that. By the way, you've just mentioned India and the legislation that they're introducing regarding Bitcoin. On the day they announced it, I watched that very closely. Bitcoin traded up. Bitcoin no longer cares about things like that, even though right. India, as you rightly say, is a big country. China has tried it. Russia has tried it. Right Now India is doing it. doesn't matter. This ship has sailed. Most of the Bitcoin are probably in the United States, which is, by the way, another interesting aspect when it comes to the most powerful central bank on the planet, which is the Fed, doing something about Bitcoin. It is really if they did something about it. First and foremost, it's Americans, I think, who own Bitcoin and who are in that business. When you look at Coinbase, Gemini, right? I mean, all of Genesis, all of these are American firms. So is Tesla. Yeah. Is there any official numbers as to, because I saw one stat, but this is like, it's like a, a century ago in Bitcoin terms, because it's probably a few months ago. Where it talked about like ninety five percent of of the value of Bitcoin was owned by two percent of the holders. Is there any like, yeah, you have to these, that anymore? Or? Yeah, you have these whales, and these whales, by the way, are also increasing, which goes to show that there are a lot of weak hands out there. In the same way that you know people are buying GameStop, people are buying leveraged Bitcoin. Many people do that on a leveraged basis, which probably is the wrong way of going about this, anyways. And then they uh, they get shaken out, right? Because they cannot survive a 20% correction. The people that already have 1,000 Bitcoins, those whales, they just happily accept it and say, well, thank you. I'm, you know, it, it goes from 40,000 to 30,000 as it did three weeks ago. Fine, give me your Bitcoin. You're being margin called, you're liquidated by uh, your broker. It's now mine, thank you. So we have this this gap in the Bitcoin market in the same way that we have that gap in the society, in the same way that we have the gap in wealth distribution. And it's kind of like the Pareto rule, 80-20, it's even more uh, pronounced pronounced exactly in Bitcoin. So I don't know. Look, I mean, these, these things, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist and I don't want to become too philosophical about it, right? Because there's a lot of people that speak about on podcasts, well, this is unfair. And it shouldn't have been distributed that way and it, Bitcoin should have been distributed more fairly so that everybody can participate. Well, look, it's, yeah, maybe that is true. It's still history and you cannot change it today, right? The only thing that we can do is position ourselves in the direction of trends or, you know, do trends, which uh, do trades, which we think makes sense. So, yeah, absolutely. But you've just mentioned if only the central banks stopped their negative interest rate policies, then the markets would be more normal. And I I could not agree more. And it's probably when we had the last couple of conversations uh, already in, in 2020, Niels, you've probably heard me a couple of times sounding a little bit worried about, you know, cash. And I've probably mentioned something like cash is trash and, you know, words such as this, which goes to show that I'm thinking about that and I actually want to you know, tie that back uh, later on to trend following, if if you don't mind. But speaking about the negative interest rates, I think the economy is completely distorted since many, many years, and willfully so, in plain eyesight by all participants, right? And it may very well reach a point where the wheels will pop off that card. And I have the feeling that the probabilities are now rising, looking at balance sheet expansions, etc., that this will happen within the next 10 years. So it's going to be, hopefully, 
in your lifespan and in my lifespan, right? And we'll see some extraordinary fireworks. Maybe we don't, but I, this is kind of like what I mentioned at the beginning. I have that feeling that something's off here. You know, these markets are a, a dynamic cocktail. And therefore, you know, as I said before, be careful. But these negative interest rates are, I think, wrong. They are wrong. They are a tax on everyone. They distort risk-taking. They cause massive asset price inflation in real estate and everything that's physical, which widens the social, the social gaps in countries and creates a lot of tension. And I really, I, as you know, I play tennis, enjoy playing tennis. I, I once thought about this in a metaphor of a tennis match. So like, you know, you have this on, on the one side, there's the Fed. And the you know the Fed plays a plays a nice shot and everything's fine right and and you're the player you return that ball and um, but the Fed kind of like goes well I have this magical golden racket now right and and now I'm going to really smash one over to you and um, you have no chance so this golden racket is a negative interest rate it's quantitative easing right so you complain to the referee the referee doesn't listen to you but gives you a candy bar and goes like well you know here for your tea is enjoy that candy bar and have a break so you have that candy bar. And your waistline inflates. Here's the inflation, right? So every time the Fed uses its golden racket and, you know, does an inside-out curveball, which you have no chance of returning, you get this candy bar, you become fatter and fatter and fatter. And at some point, and I guess we're reaching that point, you know, the spectators realize, well, that that match is really boring. We we have, this is, you know, no, nothing's going on. This obese man has no chance of winning. So they all go, we need to train that man and get him back in shape. And we need to get him off these candy bars um, and give him some exercise. Well, that exercise is probably a non-distorted economy and higher interest rates, um, you know, which is you get put on a diet with these higher interest rates. But I have the feeling that we're probably at a point where the Fed being the player cannot pull that racket out of its racket back. Because if it did, and it only increased rates by 10 or 20 or 100 basis points, 200 basis points, the government is bankrupt and can no longer pay its debts because the interest rate obligations and the interest rate payments that are due are too high. So maybe this will be this tie break thing where, you know, we've kicked the can down the road and that match of the Fed against that obese player has been going on. It's now in the tie break. And um, the only way to end that game is is a reset um, and, and start fresh because um, the Fed cannot increase interest rates and get that player back into shape to continue the match. Yeah, I completely agree. I think they have put themselves in, in a corner. And, and I think um, I've certainly mentioned that before in some of the earlier episodes. For me, I don't think we're going to wait 10 years for this to happen. And this is obviously based on just, I don't know what the, the word is, but I can't help uh, noticing there is a massive Fibonacci cluster, if you believe in that kind of stuff, in the year 2021. So for me, the question is if last year was the big correction, but it was just super fast, so it kind of didn't really feel like a big crisis. So I still expect that we have a bigger crisis uh, in front of us and... Uh, and you're right. I mean, we we have to at some point come off this uh, regime because it's yeah. destroying so many things, unintended consequences, as they call it. Exactly. And and you know, ever since Donald Trump uh, in 2016, we got very used to the term fake news, right? Because everything was kind of like fake news, and you, you got tired of that term. But then, you know, I I had a look at inflation numbers and CPI numbers, not the American CPI numbers, but the German CPI numbers. It's called the Konsumentenpreis Index. It's essentially the same thing, right? So it's, it's a basket of goods. And I always wondered, like, you know, they're coming up when they release these numbers. I was like, look, inflation is really low. And therefore, the quantitative easing stands of the central banks, the ECB in here in Europe, is justified, right? Because we do not have inflation and they should keep rates low or lower them even further, right? And we should do fiscal spending and combine monetary and fiscal and give people stimulus checks and you know, all these type of things. So, and I just, you know, didn't want to take that just as a, oh, here's the news, and because they report a 1.5% annual inflation number or a 0.9% annual inflation number, I, I just... 
I wanted to have a look at that and see what it actually is that they're reporting there, right? Because it's very easy to say, oh yeah, it's in the news, therefore it is correct. And so what I found out, and I, I wrote a blog post about it. No, I didn't write a blog post about it. I, I put it into the two quants focus report. But what I found out when you look into the mechanics of a CPI basket, at least the German one, right? It is mean reverting. It's definitely not trend following and it's actively managed. So let me explain what I mean with that. It's actively managed in the sense that if it is discovered that, say, the price of meat, the price of your T-bone steak has increased year on year, it is assumed that you are a homo economicus and you, Niels, will therefore react to that price increase and reduce your consumption of steak going forward and replace it with tofu, which has decreased in price. So by decreasing the value and the weight of goods in a basket that have risen in price and increasing the weight of, of uh, goods in a basket that have fallen in price, you obviously lower inflation. That is a mean reverting effect, right? As soon as that basket starts trending, in our trend following parlance, right? You put on a mean reversion position. You take profits on that stake and you buy tofu instead. And this is artificially, and I think willfully, probably on purpose, uh, designed in such way that inflation numbers reported to the public can be reported as low. Because if they reported them as high, people wouldn't like that, right? If you report to a German that inflation is 5%, people here are going nuts, right? That's kind of like, no, 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 no. Sure. We cannot accept 5% inflation, right? So politicians have a very valid interest in reporting and keeping these numbers low. And when you look in the term sheet, and, and I did, as to how that stuff is calculated, it kind of like makes you... Man, I mean, this is just awfully wrong, right? And it's it's sand in your eyes. And true inflation numbers are way, way higher than what is reported with these indexes. When you speak to people here, and we, we had the euro introduced around the millennium, right? The Deutschmark, euro Deutschmark was 195, right? So you got one euro for 1.95 Deutsche Marks. 20 years later, when you ask people, speak to people, what do you think would the exchange rate be today? They all say at least, at least one to four, at least one to four, which means that the euro has debased by 50% from four to two viewed from today over a mere 20 years. And I think this is true because when I go out and, you know, it's, it's <laughs> the easiest things you remember. I mean, I don't, purchase that many packs of butter, but you know, you sometimes go out and you, you buy a beer, right? The price of beer has certainly doubled. And it's not the commodity price inflation that has caused it to double. And it's not wage price inflation that has, you know, caused it double. Wages are down. The average wage of the average worker is down over the last 20 years, right? So this is not the reason. Technology improvements are up, right? All this, all this should have led to lower prices because production is more efficient. And yet the price of beer, of a bottle of beer has doubled. And the price of your phone has doubled and the price of your car has doubled. And essentially everything that I can remember looking back 20 years has doubled in price. And this worries me because I think it has happened and you don't feel it that acutely year on year because it's only 2.5%, right? So 2.5%, okay, well, 2.5%, this is um, two or three trading days on a trend following trading system. So don't worry about 2.5%. But that stuff has never a drawdown. Right, it goes 2.5% year one, next year, next year, next year, it compounds. And before you know it, 20 years down the road, you've lost 50% of your money. And this is really something that is, and at some point, I'll, I'll let you ask your question, I want to tie that back to trend following. But it is something that I'm thinking about a lot these days. And I'm not thinking about completely exiting the system and kind of like going out of it and just being long gold and, you know, hiding in some corner and staying away from fiat. But it does make you think about what you want to do with cash and what you want to be exposed to going forward in terms of assets. Okay. So, I mean, I'm completely unprepared for uh, this topic. I did not know that that was coming. But one question um, that I think I can muster at this point is just, I don't know if you're saying that things like Bitcoin could be kind of an inflation hedge. I just don't really buy that in the sense that Bitcoin has, has been around now for, what, 13 years, and um, we haven't really had lots of inflation. 
So I don't really know how we can kind of say that it's an inflation hedge. I think we've had massive inflation. Asset price inflation has been oh yeah, asset substantial. Price, but sure. And I don't. I'm. I'm not saying that. Look, I mean, Bitcoin is a scarce asset. As is gold. It's more scarce than gold. Even I tend to believe that scarce assets, scarce IP. You know, if you have a very good intellectual property, scarce trading system, scarce character and people, all of that is very valuable. This, I think, scarcity in itself is a valuable property. Whether that correlates with inflation, look, I mean, Bitcoin is so volatile. It's kind of like uh, it, it's still a baby asset. It has, you know, eleven years on its shoulder. I'm not sure if uh, if you can really, you know, at that point, view it as an inflation edge. I don't think people people have it on their balance. It's sheet a bit early, I think, at least. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> I think so too. But you're right. From what I can tell, the only thing, really, that drives the price of Bitcoin is the scarcity, right? The fact that there is no more than these coins. And I think more and more people have come to that realization that that is the driver. And for based on that, you can certainly argue that it can go to, to the moon, right? I mean, if more and more people want to buy it, they're going to have to pay more for it. I just don't buy myself this store of value and all of that. I think it's too early to say. I don't think it's an inflation hedge. Who knows? Bitcoin has certainly had its periods of time when it's gone down in value uh, during the last 11 years as well. So I don't know. I think those things will will maybe pan out, maybe not in my lifetime, but we'll see. But it certainly is a, an asset that has scarcity and, and that what is um, driving the price as it is. Anyways, we do have some questions. Now, the first question is from Kevin, and I apologize, Kevin, because it's really a question you, you sent us um, for the uh, conversation with Rob last week, but I completely missed it in the in the email. So, um, you know, I hope you accept a week's delay, and um, here is your question. He says, the question is for the podcast. It relates to systematic slash trend, systematic investing slash trend following with no stops. I'm finding that when trends change, there is often whipsaw action, especially in lower volatility instruments, some stocks, currencies. Are there any popular strategies that can be put in place to minimize the whipsaw action? You're asking me, I guess. I mean, I'm happy to go first. I mean, I agree that there is some truth to the fact that when you see when prices start to get more volatile, that can certainly mean that we're getting close to some kind of change in trend. So you do get whipsawing. What I will say here, Kevin, is that there are times when trend following without stops, which is what we do at Don, right? We don't use stops. There are times where that can be a benefit for sure because you avoid some of these unnecessary being stopped out of position, so to speak. But I think there can be equally as many times where the stop is what's going to reduce your give back because it just gets you out more promptly. So I don't know if there is a right or wrong. And maybe you could say that if you want to have something that's truly diversified, you should trade some strategies that uses stops and some strategies that uses a different kind of risk management, perhaps. That would be my thoughts. Hmm. What about you, Moritz? Yeah, I cannot and will not trade without stops. And, and I'm happy to explain why that is. And I don't want to critique uh, you, Niels, or Dunn in, in the way that you do trend following. You do it in a great way. It's just me. I, I cannot trade without stops. I need them for protection and for for having a good night's sleep, to be honest. But sure. there's also a technical reason why I need stops. I need stops in order to calculate my correct position size, a position size that is an equal loss expectation for every trade that I take. And if I do not have a stop, if I don't know when I need to get out before I get into the trade, which is, by the way, an important thing, I, I do know where I get out when I get into the trade. If I don't know that, then my trade could cause me to realize a much larger loss than expected. Because, you know, you, you take a position and if you don't have a stop, 
I'm not sure what your rule is. Maybe you revisit that position once a month, kind of like in a time series momentum context or when you get a new signal. But by the time you get a new signal, maybe to flip your position or because a month has ended, a position that you had the intention of losing, say, 25 bips of your equity on at most may have lost you 2.5% because it just, you know, didn't have a stop and it moved against you. So this goes against the stuff that I need to chisel into my brain, which is if you want to have that long call option profile, if you want to be a good trend follower, you have to keep these losses small and you have to let the winners run. If I allow my losses to get larger, disproportionately larger than others, I feel I'm violating that rule. And so this is my answer to that. It, it has a technical reason, as I've said, for position size calculation, and it has a philosophical reason, which is, you know, me viewing trend following in that type of way, which, by the way, is also the reason that I cannot and will not ever trade continuous systems. Um, because it's, it, you know, it feels like, why do I need to have a position in a market all the time. I've never found a clever person that was able to really explain that to me. The only thing they could come up with is, well, I've done a back test and it looks fairly cool to do it that way with vol control and all that type of stuff. And I go like, again, um, <laughs> let me use that tennis thing again, right? If you play tennis, you have to hit every ball because if you do not return the ball, you will lose the match, right? So you're kind of like your hands are forced. You need to return. You need to play. But in markets, you don't need to play. Nobody forces you to play. In poker, you don't need to play. You can fold your hand, right? So we have the advantage, which is ma a massive advantage of not being forced to play. And if the conditions aren't right, if my system doesn't want to get in a market, I'll leave it alone. I'm flat and I don't play. I only play when my system has detected that now it's a good time to play. And other than that, I'm staying away from that game. And so this may, again, I don't want to critique anyone because at the end of the day, these things turn out in a similar way. But everyone, I think if you, you need to find your own way of trading. And these are important cornerstones for my trading style is I use stops and I need to have flat positions. All right. We will definitely leave it at that and move on to Simon's question that came in uh, as a comment in YouTube. I just want to say, Simon, that this was more coincidental that I noticed. I appreciate your comment on YouTube, but I don't normally check those. So again, if if, if people have a question, you should definitely email them to info at toptradersonplug.com. That is where I will make sure that they get on the show. Now, anyway, Simon, um, you write, um, can you maybe talk about the fundamental business risk, general risk factors that are not directly related to the strategy itself? How do you quantify sources of risk other than the stock return characteristics itself? Which high level monitoring are you performing? How do you, uh, how to handle accountability or transparency to different investors, etc.? So, a different questions uh, question than uh, what we normally get. So general risk factors, uh, Moritz, anything that you look at in particular? I'm out of the business, as you know, so I guess you're more you're better suited to answer that. Yeah, no, I mean, but 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 we I guess we do face uh, kind of similar uh, whether we are internal or external. But but of course you do have business risk, right? And I think uh, running a business means you have to be good at at many things as a company nowadays. Of course. Compliance regulation is very important. Operations is incredibly important. Trade execution; those are the things that you you cannot afford not to pay closely attention to. What's funny about the firm that I work for, Don, is that actually a lot of the senior people in the management is really accountants by background. So they they have a natural tendency to uh, attention to detail. Let me put it that way. So we spend a lot of time. The, we, I think you say that you cross the T's and dot the I's, right? So, uh, and that is important on all levels uh, of the business. So, I don't know that our types of business is different from many other types of business, right? You need to be good at 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 everything really in your in order to run a successful business, because otherwise, it's going to catch up with you at some point. And this is also why, in in some ways, I would say that when you do look at a manager. I do think there's a difference between someone who has come up with a brilliant system perhaps and got a 
great three-year track record, right, than someone who's actually been able to run a business successfully for 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years, it does say something about their ability um, to handle that side, um, which is, as, as I think you suggest, equally important than just the returns themselves. So those would be some of my thoughts to that question. We can move on to a question from Danny. Danny asks, have you ever considered using a portfolio level stop? For example, if your entire portfolio is down 10% in a single week, liquidate all positions. The rationale is that drawdowns of 20, 30 or 40% will always start with a drawdown of 10. So this could be a way to short circuit a catastrophic decline. What do you think the advantages or disadvantage of such a rule would be? Is this something that you have backtested? So I'm going to leave that for you, Moritz, to begin with. I have not backtested it. Well, I'm, I'm not very keen on backtesting it, to be honest. And um, I fear that sample size and whatever level that you're choosing for that stop is going to be really too small to be statistically valid. You will probably start picking a variety of levels, which is step one in curve fitting, right? So you start at 10% and maybe you figure out that 10% doesn't work. So you use 15% and 15 doesn't work. But when you use 25%, 25 is a good stopping point to to stop for a month. But how often did that happen in your backtest? Um, I don't know. It depends on how long you're trading, how long your backtest runs. Maybe it has happened 10 times, 20 times, but it probably hasn't happened a thousand times. So um, I'm not very keen on doing that. I think that, and we've discussed that, there's probably that uncle point where it's too painful. You have too big of a drawdown. You're too deep in a hole that you may have to reduce your leverage in order to avoid risk of ruin, and you may, you may overwrite your system. It's probably natural for a systematic model-driven trader to do that because we're all discretionary traders, but we're model-driven in our day-to-day -day actions until we decide to change the model, right? But other than that, I want to have the confidence in my trading system that it can easily recover from a 10% drawdown, and I don't want to be stopped out at that point in time and be on a waiting list. Remember last year, uh, November, Niels, I was in drawdown for essentially nine months or so, right, for pretty much all of 2020 after the uh, the COVID crash in March. And uh, I was in a 10% drawdown probably, I don't know, mid-November or something like that. And boom, in no time had I stopped myself out there. I mean, I ended the year slightly positive 2020 on my trend-following trading system. So no, I, I don't want to do that. I'll, I'll just continue to trade and take every trade I don't want to run the risk of missing a really good trade that may be coming up and be thrown at me when I am in this pause period. And for how long do you pause? I mean, there are so many questions that you need to to answer there that I'm not really keen on not even thinking too much about that. So I'll answer the question a little bit differently. Not that I disagree with what Moritz said, but I actually, back in the 1990s, I used to work with a manager that had some funny rules. Even back then, when I was relatively young in this industry, I thought they were kind of interesting because they were short-term traders and they had rules about, oh, if they were down like 5% for the month, I'm just picking a number here, they would stop trading for the rest of the month. They had rules about if they were up 5% for the month, they would take the profits and stop trading for the month and just start every time. So that's one thing that I've seen in my career. I am also pretty sure when I say that there are some managers out there who will reduce risk based on certain drawdowns. I'm 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 almost 100% sure that there are people who use rules like that where they will decrease position sizes across the board. They would never liquidate everything, but they would certainly decrease by a, a significant percentage if they hit certain drawdown levels and then they would have rules for getting back and increasing it again. I have no idea whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I agree with Morris that if you have a strategy that you believe in and you've tested it and you've traded it hopefully for a long time and you've seen what it's capable of doing and how it manages drawdowns, hopefully that will give you confidence enough to, to trade it. But I obviously also agree with you that a 50% drawdown starts with a 10% drawdown. So I'm not you know, I'm not blind to the fact that that there is some 
maybe some benefits for for people if if you can find you know good rule for me it's all about the rules right i mean you can make whatever rules you want i don't think a rule should be to get out of all your positions because how are you going to then start making money again but generally speaking if if you have rules in terms of reducing risk just like we have rules for being stopped out uh, to some extent may, maybe that could work i've not tried it myself so i can't say but but it's an interesting thing and if you want to test it and you find something that that works um you should go with it especially if you believe it in so that would be my answer danny and appreciate your question last question today is from stasius i hope i pronounced your name correctly and especially because you actually start your your question with a really nice comment um you write long time listener since 2015 now that I appreciate because I started the podcast in May of 2014 so you you were early so I really appreciate that and you go on to say I want to open by saying thank you for producing such a great podcast on systematic investing I've learned a lot about concepts ranging from asset allocation to risk management it's a pleasure to listen to conversations between people that a plain vanilla retail investor who simply manages their own personal savings would never have the opportunity to engage with. So thank you again. So I just want to acknowledge you for that, Sassius. Uh, thanks so much. Now, here's your question. This is the first time I've submitted a question. I would like to ask if you can comment on to what the extent which hedge fund performance is driven by the ability to take maximum advantage of tax laws and other taxes not strictly associated with the core investment strategy of the fund. Over the course of reading a few behind-the-scenes pop finance books such as Dark Towers, among others, I've come across multiple instances where it's been said that the hedge funds are able to produce the returns they do because they have the resources to figure out how to reduce their tax liability as much as possible. Although it can be argued that the bottom line numbers are what they are at the end of the day, I think I'd want to know just how much of a fund's performance is due to real trading slash investment skill versus tax accounting and legal skill as an allocator of my own and other people's money. I would think an allocator would want their money to go to someone with real investment skill rather than someone who is an expert in quote-unquote gaming tax accounting and legal entity structuring rules. Furthermore, as a matter of principle and in an ideal world, I don't think funds that actively strive to earn their returns through complex accounting, even if it's legal and above board, is something that should necessarily be encouraged. Is this an issue? that is significant enough to be a differentiating factor in the professional investment world when funds market themselves to allocators. So before you jump in, Moritz, let me just say one thing here, Stasius, and that is certainly in the pure managed futures slash trend following world where we only trade futures really for the most part. This is not something that we have to get involved in, right? There is no tax optim uh, optimization or anything going on. And the reason for that is we trade the the markets. Our performance is transparent. Now, the, your, the, the funds that we offer are typically offered in jurisdictions where there is no taxation inside the fund so that the investor will be taxed only based on their own domicile and the rules that they apply to. But that has nothing to do with tax optimization the way you've referred to it. And this is something that maybe Moritz knows more about than I do, but I think what you're referring to is a lot what's going on maybe in the, quote-unquote, the real hedge fund world where you trade equities through certain different structures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and where tax liabilities could be an issue. I don't really know much about it, to be honest. But maybe you, Moritz, uh, have come across some of these um, some of these issues in a broader scheme of things. I have not, and it's very difficult for me to to really comment on that because I'm I'm no tax expert other than paying my taxes. That's I'm pretty much on time with that all the time. But uh, really, I mean, this is there's. This is so complex, uh, especially here in Germany, that um, and it bores me. So I'm trying to stay away <laughs> from it. And as you rightfully say, with our futures trading or kind of like in the CTA space, uh, any 
probably tax optimization stuff probably isn't all that relevant anyways. What I'd like to bring up though is there's there's and and you know I, I can mention that now even though we're only releasing it tomorrow. But last week we had I've had a video conversation with um Gregory Suckerman, which will go live on twoquants.com tomorrow. And this is about the book, The Man Who Solved the Markets. But Gregory has been on many podcasts before speaking about the book, but I didn't want to create a duplicate discussion. And it was really more about, well, what do you think is Rentec doing? And why can they produce greater than 60% returns while nobody else can? Is it because they are so clever? Is it because they have substantially higher leverage offered to them by banks? Or is it, for instance, because of tax advantages? And it has come up that Rentec has used certain, say, you know, tax uh, rules um, aggressively, maybe not illegally. I don't know. I think there has been a compensation payment made to the IRS in the United States a couple of years back. So there has been something going on there, but to what extent that is really the key driver behind their returns, obviously, I don't know that. But um, anyway, if, if you're interested in that in that discussion, it's going to go live tomorrow. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Let me quickly run through some uh, performance as we just crossed the hour mark. So we want to be respectful of your time. And uh, Friday, I think, was an okay day from memory for all CTAs in general. So these numbers as of Thursday evening might be a little bit understated. But anyways, the beta 50 index is up 3.18% for February and up 2.12% for the year so far. SOCGEN CTA index up 3.48% so far in Feb and up two and a quarter for the year. The trend index up 4% for the month, up three and a quarter for the year. And the SOCGEN short-term traders index uh, is up one and a quarter roughly this um, February. Still down actually 0.42% for the year. Now, of course, we know for those who follow equities, it was a great week as well. So MSCI World is up, I think, 5.9% in February and up 4.8% so far this year. But the bonds, the World Government Bond Index is down about 60 pips so far month to date. Now, um, we normally share some kind of podcast or resource we've read or heard during the week. Moritz, uh, I know you have been busy, but did you have time to listen to something or read something that you thought was interesting? I've listened to a couple, but sometimes I can't remember all of them. The one podcast that I do remember, and probably that means it's been a, a good one, is again been uh, Macro Voices. I think you've mentioned it earlier with uh, James Bianco. And and I like yeah. that. It had to do, it touched on the GameStop mania in retrospect, but it also touched on inflation and um, the macroeconomic outlook from here. So I, I found that interesting and well done. I can recommend it. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. For me, it was actually listening to uh, the founder of GMO, Jeremy Grantham, or one of the founders, I guess he was, on Matt Faber's show. I thought that was a very uh, honest, conversation where he also shared some of his uh, his losses his uh, at least paper losses in his career and uh, of course of just so listening to someone with so much experience i think is always a super interesting but on that note we're going to wrap up this week's conversation we hope that you have enjoyed it and if you did please head over to itunes and leave a rating and review so that more people can find the podcast and to help you make it easier and if you don't know how to make a review, you can go to toptradersonplug.com forward slash review. And then you have all the instructions. I hope that is not too much to ask for. Next week, I'm joined by Jerry. He's back. Make sure you send your questions. You can email them to info at toptradersonplug.com. And we'll do our best to answer all of them. And uh, of course, you can always follow us on Twitter and other social media platforms. From Moritz and me, thanks so much for listening. And we look forward to being back with you next week. In the meantime, take care, be well, stay safe. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. 
And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.